It's important because all religious subjects are important, all political subjects are important, because all of them need to be reappraised in the light of reality, because we have not faced reality, because we as a people live in a world of fantasy. And once we face reality and use religions properly, and once we understand how they are used by other people, and once we separate, not so much as separate, spirituality from religions and understand that out, out of our spirituality came the world's religions and that we have been naive and let people take from us the basis, the elements, make religions and come back and sell them to us. Once we understand that and that we had a much better version of the same religions before their former creation, and then once we recover from the shock of discovering that we had something better than what was sold to us, rehashed from our elements, then go back and take the great spirituality we had and move with it. And once we understand what we were and where we are, we will understand what we have to be and where we still have to go. We are still thinking minority when we were never a minority. But we are letting minority people fool us into thinking minority. And we are literally being controlled by minorities who endear themselves to other minorities by demonstrating their ability to control us. And they control us by manipulating images through politics, religion, in the mass media. All right, the subject admittedly is dangerous. As religion is a delicate and dangerous subject, and it's even more delicate and dangerous when you're talking to people of African descent. Because where religion is concerned, we are a purist people. We are the true believers. We out Pope the Pope and out Muhammad Muhammad. We believe in things in its purest form and we actually believe things are exactly what they say they're supposed to be. We have a humanity that actually makes us believe that people believe in democracy and the inventors of it don't believe in it. And we had democracy before they think they invented it. And when they invent a fake version of it and sell it to us, we accept the fake version and neglect the genuine democracy that we have been living all along. Not only democracy, but humanity. We have had a historical fascination for ideas that come from the outside. And this has been our trap. And we have not studied those people who sell us fake trinkets, fake ideals, fake government forms, and rehash our religions that we invent in the first place. Now, all of the elements 
that went into the making of Christian, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam came out of Africa. And you have to distinguish between the elements and the formal organization of the religions themselves. The religions began to decline when outsiders, foreigners, took over those elements, organized them for their own political purpose, gave them a name, and began to project them to the world for their political purpose. Then the outsider created a religion, but he forgot the African substance and the African substance was spirituality. Because if you have spirituality, you can use any one of them or none of them. Because the African spirituality encompassed the essence of all of them. The white man has religion, but he has no spirituality. Then you must study and understand the difference between Islam and Arabism, something which is difficult for black people to understand. The Arab did to Islam what the white man did to Christianity. He subtracted the spirituality and made it a political instrument for his opportunism. But when it came over to the African, the African accepted the spiritual aspect of it and forgot that to the Arab it was then and still is a political game and that the spiritual aspect left him very early and that he was then and is now playing a game and that the spiritual aspect never touched him. And if you Listen with me with some kind of patience. I will tell, show you exactly what I mean because if you see that it was the African who used this religion spiritually and it was the Arab who used it politically, it is the African who still uses it spiritually and it is the Arab who still use it politically. If you look at the present day Sudan, where the Arab had declared, have declared war on African cultures, so the, and he not only, he's de, while he's declared war on African cultures, he's eating bacon, drinking scotch, and patronizing European hearts. He is as holy as a dog. <laughs> and yet, you can go to Egypt and order scotch, bacon, or anything you want from the West, including a Western woman, and you can go to an African country that is Muslim, and if you order scotch, you might be put in jail. I am saying that Senegal, a Muslim African country, is more Muslim in its practice of the faith than Saudi Arabia. And you have African countries because Africans in general believe in the spirituality of the religion and while the Arabs practice the political aspect of the religion devoid of spirituality. And it is the African side of Islam that has used it 
for spirituality. It was the African side of Islam and the African side of Islam alone that has used it as a rallying cry for social reform and revolutionary change. Now, in a speech at the African Poetry Theater a few weeks ago, I asked the audience, could anybody name one Arab who ever, who could use, who used Islam as a rallying cry for revolutionary change? A Senegalese student rose up and said, Qaddafi, which proved he don't know good, could, what Qaddafi is doing. Qaddafi is an, is an Islamic zealot who is trying to use Islam to start a new form of Islamic and Arab imperialism. He's doing a few good things to disguise his con game. Otherwise, why would he be in Chad and Niger? He's looking for minerals. He's looking for resources. And he's backing those African countries that he can Islamize. Then why would he build a mosque in Ghana? And when Ghana wanted some money for a sewage system, he would refuse. see the politics, but you don't see the spirit. Now, there's some things he's done that I can admire. I've been in Libya three times, and I've talked to him twice. He has a country, two-thirds desert. It's almost self-sustained in food. That is to be admired. You've got African countries rich in soil, rich in forests buying rice from Texas, and they got big rivers running through the country, and all rice needs is water, moisture. All sugarcane needs is moisture. You got them buying sugar from other countries, not making the best use of their own resources. And yet, he has made better use of his resources internally than many countries in Africa that have 10 times more resource. That's a plus for him in taking care of his people. But his external program is a form of Islamic colonialism that the African can't see. The African has got the illusion that there's somebody gonna do something for them for nothing. The European, and the Arab are similar. Their intention is to come to power and to use the religion as an instrument of power. Now, I believe religions should be instruments of spirituality and moral uplift the African obviously believes the same, and that is the way it should be used. But if you name, every time you name an African revolutionary who used Islam as a rallying cry for revolutionary change against colonialism, it is the black side of Islam. Now, I can wrap off all these African revolutionists, and it, it nearly always became part of that same basic structure. Now, I am not against Islam. I see it as a force in human history that has to be reckoned with, and that at times has command, respect, and can again command world respect. If forced to the wall, and if I have to choose between it and Christianity, I would choose it. I am that disgruntled about Christianity. 
I'm that disgruntled about it because I think both of them have failed their mission to mankind. And there is no excuse for them failing in their mission to mankind. I don't excuse either one of them as I don't excuse the United States or Russia for failing their promise to mankind. I think they're both two thugs. I'm not equating Christianity and Islam with, with, with Russia and the United States. I am saying that these are world forces that made promises and that these two thugs who met in an icebox recently to reflect their temperament and their character. <laughs> <laughs> and when these forces meet, you assume that one of them on your side, you quite forget that when they meet, they are arguing about which one of them going to rule over, over you. All right, now, let me stick to my notes because I've got more the notes and I've got time anyway. Now, my point is that we were robbed of our original religions so long ago, we have forgotten what those religions were. And once we go back to the original base of our religions before Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, and under, when we go back to those religions, those religions were based on spirituality and the God concept of those religions, of Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, came out of what I refer to as pre-God religions. I don't use that anymore because people don't understand what I mean what about pre-God religions. They are so accustomed to the word God, they cannot understand that there was a time when man thought of a force in the universe presiding over the universe. And while he meant God, he did not use the word God. And man had more spirituality before he consistently used the word God. He used the God force and the God concept without using the word. He meant the same thing. And ultimately, Western man interpreted that as meaning the same thing. But doing at this period when everything was an all encompassing, all conclusive, man did, had not created the Africans in the great river civilizations had created a religion that was so all conclusive it was not a weekend Jimmy Swagger <laughs> uh, type of religion it was a kind of religion that touched your total being it wasn't a Sunday religion uh, uh, a weekend religion it was part of your totality, your morality, your dress, your diet, your marriage, your total human being. And it dictated everything. And this is why at this period in human history, man did not have a word for jail because no one had ever gone to one. No word for offering it because no one had ever thrown away any children. No word for old people's homes because no one had ever discarded grandma or grandpa. Man was truly religious. Too religious to shirk his responsibility in any way. I'm saying that that was a truly great religious period of man. But once these foreign clowns begin to organize and misinterpret what the great Nile Valley African thinkers had and begin to slap names on them. 
and began to make political and military use of them, that's why the whole thing went wrong. Now, when we look at Islam, where the brothers go wrong, that every time they move from one religion to another, they think the new religion has been with us forever. It is the newest of the world's religions and the last one to come into the mainstream of historical consideration. And when you separate it from Arabism, if you can, and it is difficult, I must admit, but when Islam moved over into North Africa, North Africa, Northeast Africa was a fallen land. It had been raped for 1,000 years. The conquest wasn't much of a conquest. Starting with the Cambyses invasion 550, and they didn't arrive until 639 A.D. And the Cambyses invasion was 550 B.C. Over a thousand years later, they got there and they had one invader after another, Greeks, Romans. What resistance was left? All the great structure torn down. They were ready for anything when they arrived. They said they're bringing a great civilization. They arrived to feast on the fallen body of a once great culture. All right, now let's go back and pick them up at a period, the infancy of, of this thing, but let's look at these religions and look at um, these now valid civilizations. Look at them um, as the basis of Western, Western religions. And all the time this had happened <coughs> while Europe was in was in it was in its in, in its darkness. Now when you take this like a classroom teacher, you've got to go into uh, into details. And when you go into these details, you've got to look at the making of the spirituality of now valid people and to what extent this influence the people of the Tigris and the Euphrates and the development ultimately of the people who became the people called Arabs. Remember, and this is hard for the new convert to understand, that inactivity as a place in human history, the Arabs are basically an A.D. people. There is no B.C. activity of consequence that can be attributed to them. Now, if you want to build a religion around them that has been there forever, and if you want to say, as some brothers have said, God created the first Muslim, his name was Adam, I don't know what you're talking about, 
If you want to create an Islam that started before the Prophet Muhammad, again, I don't know what you are talking about. But if you want to say that the elements, the sentiment, the basic social thought that went into the making of the religion existed in Africa before Christ, I can understand what you're talking about. But if you're going to say the religion existed before Christ, I don't know what you're going to talk about. I don't know what you're talking about. Then if you say that Islam is the black man's natural religion, I don't know what you're talking about. But if you say spirituality, the spirituality that went into the making of all three of these religions is the natural spiritual inheritance of the black man, I know what you're talking about. So you have to define your, sem your, your semantics, and you've got to define your terminology before I understand what you're talking about. But you cannot say that he had a religion way back there called Islam because Islam didn't exist way back there. Islam came into existence around the 7th century A.D., and that's what we're going to deal with. Just for your information. <laughs> Some people never seen the Quran. This is it. In English and in Arabic. This is a, a short history of the of Muhammad and the early caliphs and the early heroes of Islam. This is a book all, all black Muslims should have read called Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race by Edmund Wilkmont Blyden. I have two shelves of books dealing with Islam, Arabs, and their history alone. Two shelves. And I read practically everything and every word and every book. <laughs> I grew up a Baptist Sunday school teacher. I belong to an African spirituality. I respect all religions when they practice what they preach. <laughs> Now, we have to distinguish between what a religion is, what it can be, and what it promises to be. Now, let us start with the present, then work back. Let us start with Elamazaroy's series, The Africans, because this series will and has done a lot of damage, principally because most African people who see the series never read one book on Islam, never read one book on Arab history, and do not plan to do so. And all they have is his word. And they're not going to check him out. He tells you a few good things about Africa, then he is running strictly an Arab Islamic game, and he is running it well. It is a con game, and it is not about African history at all, because he is not telling you African history. He is telling you basically a few tidbits of African history in order to get his Arab Islamic point across, and he is getting it across exceptionally well. And that is what he set out to do. Now, why don't we ask the question? A Jewish journalist fund financed it. Why haven't we asked, who is Elamazaroy? Half Africa. 
we can have Alro. <clears throat> Another question we have to ask, what is the role of the bastards of history? And he's a bastard. The bastards of history under pressure nearly always take sides with their father's side of the family that is in power. Father was an Arab. He is more Arab than the Arabs. He's black when he want to be black, when it's his, his convenience. But in this series, this man is more Arab than the Arabs. You have to know some African history to know the game he's playing. But if you don't know African history, you don't know his omissions. You don't know his omissions about Ethiopia. You don't know he's left out Bilal. He left out Zaid bin Harith. If you don't know anything about the Ethiopian period of Islam, when Ethiopia saved Islam, then when he leave it out, you don't know it because you didn't know that there was a period when Ethiopia saved Islam. But if you read the Encyclopedia of Islam, the Encyclopedia of Islam says that Bilal was a slave Zaid bin Harith was a slave. The encyclopedia of Islam on this point is wrong. Bilal was a lawyer for that day. Zaid bin Harith was a military man. They were both Ethiopians. Why Ethiopians? Why did his rich wife choose two tutors for him? Both Ethiopians. Now you got to look at Ethiopian history. Why the fascination for Ethiopia? When the prophet was born, half of Arabia was an Ethiopian colony. But if you haven't studied black imperialism, you don't know this. There was a time when Africans ruled nations and dominated nations. Well, you never read Baldwin's prehistoric nations, or uh, Ducilla Dungy Houston's uh, work recently reissued on the wonderful world of the Kushite Ethiopians. A chance, the second chapter, Chancellor Williams' work, uh, The Destruction of Black Civilization, dealing with the Southern African origins of Egypt. Look how much you have to know. Now, in his fourth stanza, the fourth session, which was really one of the better ones, dealing with exploitation, he dealt with it pretty well. He opened by downgrading the Western slave trade by 12 million people. Du Bois, in the end of the 19th century, said it was from 60 to 100 million people. The documentation has proven since then that it was at least twice that much. documentations on the Arab slave trade in a work called Slave Trade in the Indian Ocean proved that one period 35 million Africans were taken out. Then he said there's only 2 million Africans in the Arabian Peninsula. And he asked, where are those Africans? He's saved because most people don't know where are those Africans. Adam Azaroy, who's known me for 30 years, wouldn't dare stand before me and ask that question. Because <laughs> I got an answer. I know where the Africans went, who were not in the Arabian Peninsula. A lot of them went to India to perform the armies for the Maharajas. A lot of them went to Asia, different parts of Asia. Some went to China. And when the Portuguese came around, to East Africa, the Arabs formed a partnership with the Portuguese. And the Portuguese and the Arabs got together, the Omani Arabs, and El Mazaroy is an Omani Arab. The Omani Arabs established Zanzibar and made Zanzibar the largest slave trading force in the world. And if you look at the 
Magnolia trees at Zanzibar, each tree represents an African who made the mistake of looking at one of the harem women of the Arabs, because if an African looked at one of the harem women, they'd cut him head off and they'd bury his body and they would bury, plant a magnolia tree over his body. Every magnolia tree at Zanzibar represented an African who had the horrible mistake of looking at one of those women. If you look at Basil Davidson's work, A History of East Africa, look in the index, look at the word Maseroi, you'll find some information on his family. Now, he wouldn't ask me any question, what happened to those Africans? And there's only two million in the, in the Arabian Peninsula now. See, he's whitewashing the African, the Arab side of the slave trade. Now, when the meeting was called by UNESCO on slave trade in the Indian Ocean, they invited 50 Arab scholars. Not one showed up. They don't want to deal with it. And the African who is a Muslim don't want to deal with it. And those who are Muslim in this country don't even know about it and don't want to be told about it. <laughs> because they think when they left Christianity, they joined a pure thing that is without fault. I'm not saying leave it. Stay with it. Stay with whatsoever you want to stay with. But realize all Western-oriented religions are faulty. All Western-oriented religions were in the slave trade one way or the other, one time or the other. And all religions that said that God endorsed slavery are liars and hypocrites. No religion and no God ever proved of anybody enslaving anybody. The Quran, and if you doubt it, you can t take a copy here and find it. The passage says that you can beat your wife, but you have to beat her with a stick, stick only so long. The stick cannot be too large, but you can beat her. And when you go back to the laws of Habarabi, 2000 BC, from Babylonia, now you can see the origin of some of this. It's supposed to be the first civilized law. Habarabi said that slavery is a good thing. And it's all right to have a slave, but you've got to have some humanity about it. You've got to give him a day off. <laughs> <laughs> Give him a day off, it's all right. <laughs> we need to read more of other people's history and more of our history. And if we read, if we, if we had read more history, we might understand the damage that the series is doing and understand also that he is playing the role of a con man. Con man gives you a few flattering things to get you into the trap before he robs you and makes the robbery looks palatable to you until you wake up and realize that you have, you have been had. I don't know why he's going the rest of the series. I don't even know why he's going tonight. And this series will get more exposure than any, any educational series ever. It's on tonight. It'll be on Sunday and it's on cable sometime during the week. So if you miss it tonight, don't worry. It'll be on Sunday. <laughs> Why it's getting all this exposure? Somebody wants this message out there. 
Who wants that particular message out there? Who has the reason? Find, let's study its backers. Why the National Endowment for the Arts and American, your money, was buying it. That's only $650,000. It cost about $5 million. The rest came from the Annenberg Trust. What's their interest in, in backing an Arab commentator? He wrote the commentator. He wrote the book about it. And yet another series was put on by an Englishman, Basil Davison, three times better than that one and more honest. Because knowing that he was white, every time he came to a critical part of the history, he found an African and put the African historian in front of the camera and let the African explain African history instead of he doing it. <coughs> and I'm saying that the Englishman did a better job because the Englishman let the African explain instead of letting explaining himself. But Ali Mazaroy is doing all of the explaining. All right. This talk is not about Ali Mazaroy, but you have to understand something of what is happening to you. This is an Islamic whitewash. I hope you understand that. And the sad fact is that most of you and most people who saw it will not understand that this is what it is. And it is for a larger reason. And that reason is going to come out more and more. Now let's look at Africa on the eve of the rise of Islam. Religions rise and are created and grow in a vacuum. A condition has to be created for religions to rise. What was the vacuum? How did it create? Who created it? What was the condition in Africa and Western Asia, called the Middle East, on the eve of the rise of Islam. If Islam rose in the 600s AD, what was happening in the 600s AD? The Roman Empire was falling apart. The Roman Empire had been falling apart militarily since five, since 450 B.C. A.D. 450 A.D. A bunch of German thugs called Vandals moved down and hit the Roman Empire. Now, the Romans had propaganda out that the Roman was invincible militarily. And a lot of people believe this. It's just that the vandals didn't read the propaganda and couldn't read anyway. <laughs> and they did not know that if you hit a Roman, you're supposed to fall dead. And see, they just went and hit those Romans in such a way that the Romans never recovered. And they added a word to the language, vandalism, destroy everything. <laughs> they wore on men because they had a wife and children, because they're too stable. They, they resented everything. <laughs> then they moved over to Spain and started a fight with the Visigoths, the Goths and the Visigoths. But only the people who Red Roman propaganda continued to believe the nonsense, but the Romans would coax 
a long time. Now, they had already made a mess out of the management of Christianity because now the fight between the Byzantines and the regular Romans continued. When the Romans, and if, if you understand what I'm saying right now, maybe you straighten out some current thing. When the Romans stopped killing Christians and became Christians, they wanted to take over the apparatus of Christianity from the Africans who were managing it while they were killing Christians. When the European takes over anything, he wants to control all of it, not a part of it. Now, if some backward people called black leftists understood this, they would realize that if they help the white left into power, the white left is going to do them in. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm not less of a socialist because I'm saying this, but I'm more of an African nationalist than a pan-Africanist because I'm saying this. <laughs> Because I take my socialism from African social living and not from Karl Marx. I take mine straight from the originators of it who originated it before the first European wore a shoe or lived in a house that had a window. <laughs> so I know there's nothing new about it. The Africans had it all along. So I go to the original instead of the carbon copies created in Europe. Now, there are a whole lot of Africans today who don't understand that. Now, my point is that once the Romans became Christians, they accepted as a political apparatus, but the spirituality of it eluded them completely. Where are they now in history? The conference at Nicaea has already occurred, several conferences. That's behind a few hundred, a hundred years now or more. The, the Romans, out of their weakness, out of the, you must separate the political Roman Empire from the Holy Roman Empire. The political Roman Empire is death. When the political Roman Empire started to weaken, they began to have African emperors, the most colorful being September's Savius, and one of the last being Caracalla. And September Savius is noted for being, he was also the governor of England in addition to being after being governor, emperor of Rome. All right, he was from the political Holy Roman Empire, political Roman Empire. Now the Holy Roman Empire has had at this point three African popes. Tertullian being a noted one, there were three. And Tertullian wouldn't be popular today because he's really one of the first to say, vanity, vanity, thy name is woman. <coughs> to, so the, 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 the holy, holy sinner, uh, the greatest writer the church has had is behind us now, I mean, St. Augustine. St. Augustine, really, who gave the church its literature, also African, gave it its being has lived and practically died by now. Bishop of Hippo, he has written far more than the world knows, people know about this city of God and his confession. But he, he, the, there was so much of his writing that has not come down to us that is available in texts and in you know, documents. But he, he has lived and practically died by this point. At this, at this point. My main point is that the African contribution to the church has been made. And 
Augustine looks back at what these Europeans have done to Christianity, he said, makes him laugh, especially the conference at Nicaea. He, these people don't understand Christianity. Now, the fight between Byzantium and Rome over the dominance of the church has literally wrecked the church. And this mismanagement and disenchantment now would cause a camel boy. Now, because you can't read, that doesn't mean you, you, you have no wisdom. Most of the people of that period couldn't read. That don't mean they're stupid. To begin to talk to other camel boys. And <coughs> Finally, um, he began to rise up in his profession, and his uncle began to give him a little lead way he was working for his uncle, you know, in the trades, the caravan trades between the masters and, you know, and he, finally he marries a, a rich widow. This rich widow secures for him two Ethiopian tutors that the Encyclopedia Islam mistakenly called slaves, they're not slaves. And Zaid bin Harith and Bilal. Bilal is the, is the prophet's first convert. And Zaid bin Harith is listed as the third. I'm, I'm at a loss to find out who was the second of the African converts. All right. Oh, now, this is the condition. The corruption of, of Christianity has reached a point for failing to find reform to get reform, he began to send letters to the different heads of state asking them to accept the new faith. And some of them laugh at it. Some of them tap the letter. The emperor of China takes it seriously. He didn't he said, oh, so what's the big deal? <laughs> he wrecks a mosque. It's all right. <laughs> One more religion don't mean nothing to him. <laughs> so, <laughs> he, he erects a beautiful new mosque in China. I said, all right. <laughs> I mean, it didn't, didn't seem to bother him. He, he'll accept it. He'll give it a chance. Anybody want to join it? Here's, 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 your mo here's a mosque. Yeah. You make no fuss. Be fuss about it. A few accept it, a few didn't. I mean, then he tell me, either, uh, uh, go to the accept the faith or go, or go to or pick up your sword because I'm going to fight you, you know. Now, Bilal accompanies the prophet on his various missions. And he is looking for someone to call the faithful to prayer. Bilal becomes the first of the Muslim, Muslim to call the faithful to prayer. And he has looked, and he didn't, among the men, of, people of Arabia, he, he don't want to use bells, or, you know. Then he comes home one evening. Bilal is his steward and his mace carrier and general all around man. And he asks, he tells Bilal his problem. Then he asked Bilal to see if he can say the call to prayer. And he said, why have I been looking all over Arabia when you have the sweetest voice in all the land? Now Bilal becomes the one to call the faithful to prayer. And he makes out of it a great art form. And even today, if you go to Senegal and listen when, when the faithful are being called to prayer, the Africans do it, and it is a concert. It is a concert piece. Then go to Arabian, go to an Arab country and listen, almost like a bad bird singing off tone. <laughs> they, they can't bring it off to this day. They can't bring off that song. The beauty of that song, 
There's no God but Allah, Allah is, you know. It, it, it's, it's repetitious, but the, it's the African who can take that repetition and, and infuse a spiritual beauty into it that you will not find in any other country, any other place in the world. Of course, in, 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 in Libya, they just record an African voice and play it on record from the <laughs> that they get it that way. <laughs> but Libya seemed to have been the only predominantly Arab country where the five prayers are called on time and where you do see a degree of people moving toward the mosque to say the five prayers. In most Af Arab countries, the traffic keeps on and nobody pays the slightest attention to it. But in Senegal, the predominantly African country, when it comes time to say one of the five prayers, the traffic stops. And you could be going to have a baby, but the traffic stops. And my point is that whether I believe in it or not, it just so beautiful to see so many black people doing something in unison. <laughs> right or wrong is of no significance. <laughs> no significance. Just see them doing something together. <laughs> it's a thing of joy. <laughs> you, you, you notice one thing generally. The men and the women are closer together in African countries than in Arab countries. And inasmuch as the prophet's first public act at a time when, because there are desert people, when a woman had two girls, if the third child was a girl, they either got rid of her or put her to death. Women protested this. He defended their right to keep the children. Now, inasmuch as the prophet defended their right to keep their children, one wonders why and how over the years systematically Islam became predominantly a male chauvinistic religion. Here you have to separate Islam from Arabism. Maybe it was something about the desert, and maybe it was the belief that a woman needed or protection. But it, very few women rose to high position in the Arab side of the religion. And I can name one woman head of state in the black side of it, who not only headed a state, but rode in the head of her army and commanded her armies in the field. 1500s, that's Almina of Nigeria in the state of Zara. I recently recommended that she be included among Budweiser's great queens of Africa. And I purposely supervised the writing of the copy in order to eliminate a whole lot of the misconceptions about her. And they are misconceptions and rumors. The rumor was, because she never married, is that she took um, a new lover each night, and if his performance wasn't adequate, she had him killed in the morning. There was no proof of this at all. And if that rumor got out, I guess half of the male population in the world might disappear. <laughs> even, even stars don't perform at their best every night. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, that was an important thing anyway. The important thing was this strong woman def 
defended northern, it wasn't Nigeria then, it was the, in the house of country. The state of Zara defended her state and built walls of defense that still can be seen in this part of Nigeria. Defended her right as a woman without getting into the nonsense about liberation. Held her ground defended her lineage and left her mark on that territory of Africa until that part as a part of Nigeria that is literally called Elmina City. And she was a Muslim. And that did not happen any other place among Muslims for women. That did not happen. It surely did not happen any place among, among the Arabs. And the revolutionary African, especially revolutionary against colonialism, happened nearly always on that side, on the African side. That meant that the African accepted the religious side and the spirituality, and that Islam said something to the African that it did not say to the Arab, and that it still says something to the African that it is not saying to the Arab. That if Islam is to be rescued and made the great spiritual and moral religion it, in, it was intended to be instead of the political instrument for opportunities, it will be the African who will make it so. He has the capacity to make it so. And this is what we need to look at, not to ignore the Arab at all, not to ignore the fact that it was from Arabia that the religion came out, swept over into, uh, into North Africa and had its rapid growth. All right, now, <coughs> after this religion barely got underway, the prophet had some difficulty had to leave Medina, then literally had to fight his way back to Mecca. Bilal was with him all of the time, and so was Zaid bin Harid. Zaid bin Harid was the governor of the prophets tribe, the Karash, and he was married into the prophet's family, one of the highest honors possible. And he is hailed as one of the great heroes of Islam in the Encyclopedia of Islam, in other literatures of Islam. The literature of Islam writes about the great blacks, but they don't tell you they were black. And what we need to do is to do a little more research in the area of Arabia and the presence of so many Africans at the time. We need also to look at the number of African neglected heroes and Islam and bring them back to four. Bring them back into world consideration and understand that Islam came into being so fast, it is literally a religion 
made from a composite, a composite religion, and the least original of the world's religions. It had to take something from Christianity, something from Judaism, something from Zoroasterism. That is nothing that one needs to apologize for. And yet, it came into being at a time. It, had, it served a great purpose. And it had to turn to many places for haven and for shelter. On the advice of Zaid bin Harrod and Bilal, some of the key followers were sent to Ethiopia for shelter while the trouble in Arabia blew over. The prophet said, go to Ethiopia, go to that land of righteousness where no one is wrong. This is the kind of reputation Ethiopia had among Muslims at the time it had been a Christian nation for over 300 years. Other people against the move went ahead and told the Ethiopians that these people were thieves. And when the Ethiopian king received them, he said that your message is not much different from the Christian message. And he received them and sheltered them until the difficulty blew over and they went by and strengthened and got the faith well underway. Now, Bilal stayed with the prophet the rest of his life and when the prophet was dying, he literally appointed Bilal as the next caliph. And he refused it. Now look what would have happened to the faith had Bilal became the next caliph after the prophet. It would have been a different religion altogether. But he refused the honor, but he did not call the prayers except two more times after that. He called the prayers for Omar, the first caliph, and one time for a special meeting for the first caliph. And then he either went back to Ethiopia or he died. We know Zaid bin Harrod was died in a battle against the Byzantines. But these two Ethiopians had helped to lay the foundation and the strength for Islam. Islam now was ready to move out of Arabia over into North Africa, to move into the vacuum left by the confusion of the Romans and the mismanagement of Christianity. North Africa was in such a sad state that the people were ready to welcome almost anything with the disappear with the with the with the wreckage left by the Romans. So there was very little resistance. <coughs> In a little while, the Muslim armies had swept across most of northern Africa. A little resistance from the Berbers. These are relatives of the Arabs who had arrived much earlier. And this resistance didn't, um, didn't last um, too long. When this resistance died down, Islam swept into the western Sudan and began to convert Africans. Now Islam swept into the western Sudan. Understand me now, if you can visualize a map of Africa. They went down into West Africa, not 
the coast, but inland away from the coast. That is called the Western Sudan, skirting the coast. And they converted a group of Africans. And these Africans became purists. So much purists that these Africans, after 50 years or so, came back into Morocco and told the, those who converted them, you are not properly observing the faith. I'm purer than you are. Now, you have to understand this because Western Africa, the Western Sudan and Western Africa were converted by Islamized blacks. East Africa was converted by Arabs. Islamized blacks knew what part of African culture to leave intact in spite of Islam. You can see the difference to this day. And East Africa, con converted by the Arabs, who had no respect for African culture then or now, they destroyed a lot of African culture. They married African women, and after 50 years, they had produced enough black-looking Arabs, and ultimately they would use them to go inland where the Arabs were not permitted to go, and start the East African slave trade over 600 years before the European slave trade. And the Arab is the only aspect, a branch of Islam to use Islam as an aspect of slavery. <coughs> now the Africans who converted those in Western Sudan left the matrilineal system intact meaning the lineage coming down through the female, remain intact in Western Africa, while in Eastern Africa, the Arab installed the patrilineal system, meaning the inheritance comes through the oldest son, and the lineage come down through the male side of the family. It has wrecked the culture to this very day. It has confused the culture to this very day. Now, when they arrived in Egypt, they arrived at a culture that had been raped by foreigners for a thousand years. They had standing for it now. The Arab traditionally has no respect for non-Arabic culture. and practically none for African culture in other parts of Africa. And this is the basic drawback for the, and the basic difference between Arabs spreading Islam and African spreading Islam. African Islam is basically different from Arab Islam. African Arab Islam is a form of Arab supremacy and condescension. Just like white Christianity is a form of white condescension. They think they're doing you a favor to let you in their church. The church becomes their private property, just like the Arabs think they're doing you a favor when you come into one of the mosques. And if you go to Mecca and see the discrimination against colors, different colors, you will find that out, is that even in Mecca, there is color discrimination. And they'll look you straight in the eye and deny the whole thing. All right, now, they're in Egypt, but out of the Western Sudan, would come a great general, Tarak Ben Zad, a Jabaral Tarak. He would discover a weakness in Spain, fighting the Goths and the Visigoths, and the Vandals fighting among themselves. 
The dissident element in Spain would do something white people rarely ever do. They would sneak across into Africa and tell the Africans how weak the whites are and said they are so weak if you want to conquer them, it's an easy thing to do. Jabral would send a testing army by 10,000 just to test their lines. You find it is easy. Then later, he would send 60,000. He'd take Spain. Now this is purely an African conquest. You are not dealing with the Arab conquest of Spain at first because the Arabs were not there at first. The initial conquest of Spain was African, not Arab. That army came from the Senegambia, now Senegal, and parts of what is now Mauritania. <coughs> and when they moved over and conquered Spain, Madame Bagiba has written a book on it that bears the name, Tyrak Ben Zad. The Rock of Gibraltar is named after him. It's the hill or the mountain of Tyrak. Gibraltar is a corruption of his name, Jabaral. And she describes the army going into Spain. She says the army was black as ink, the general was blacker still. Meaning, the general was the only one riding a white horse. So his blackness against that whiteness looked blacker than the rest of them. But the horse was better dressed than the kings of Europe, with silk and brocade. And the women taking off garments and throwing him in front of his horse, waving. <laughs> Let me be the first. I'd like to see Hollywood put this in technical. <laughs> militarily, the Africans took over Spain, and militarily, the Africans held Spain until 1240, while the Arabs did come in. But the military hold on Spain was Africa. Now let's look at the Africans and the Arabs, that combination called Moors in Spain. What did they do? What did the Africans give to Islam? Why do you find a toleration between Christians and Arab, Christians and Muslims in Spain that never existed before ever? It is the African spirituality. They coexisted with the Catholic Church side by side. They worked out a humane agreement. No mass killing. They built public schools. They built public baths. There's a chapter in John Jackson's Introduction to African Civilization called Africa and the Civilizing of Europe. It would do well to read it. That chapter alone is worth the price of the book. <laughs> but there are many other books on the Africans and the Arabs in Spain. They gave Spain the greatest civilization it has known before or since. They built a great university, Salamanca. They translated the great works of the masters of Europe, including a lot of work they had stolen from Africa. Europe had forgotten its own masters. The Africans translated. It was the African that suggested that the Jews be appointed to the chairs in the Mayan sciences. God, what an error. 
<laughs> All the ideology chairs. It was the Africans who took the Jews into Spain and made them the grandees, the money managers of Spain. And when the Africans lost power, some of them went to Holland and found the Dutch East Indian and the Dutch West Indian Company and became managers of the slave trade. People find no compunction of turning on us when it's their convenience to do so. But their performance and the partnership between the Africans and the Arabs and the Berbers in Spain was a long and beneficial partnership and a fine moment in their history and in world history. The African and the Arab and Islam had united and held Europe at bay for almost a thousand years. And when that partnership went bad, both of them were in trouble. By 1450, the Africans and the Arabs began to argue among themselves over nonsense at first. But 1240, the Portuguese had broken away from the Africans, but Spain was still under their domination. Then half of Spain, by 1455, had broken away the Castilian part. And now they had colonial aspiration of their own and they went to the Pope to discuss the matter. He was the leading authority of the world where Europe is concerned. Now they wanted a piece of the world. They wanted to start dividing up the world among themselves. And the Pope told them, you are both authorized to reduce to servitude all infidel people. In other words, you need not feel guilty about the slave trade that had already started along the coast of West Africa. The fact that there were great independent states inside of Africa is something we'll I'll talk about later on. My main point here is that Islam had swept down into the Western Sudan that a lot of people said the great states of Ghana, Mali, and Sungay were Muslim states. Ghana was never a Muslim state. In fact, Ghana was destroyed by Muslims. But Abu Bakr of the Susus, when he pulled his army out of Ghana to help his co-religionists in Spain, he died. talking about these other states in more detail in another way. But what I'm concluding with is that the spread of Islam into the Western Sudan had brought a language, a sense of accounting, and a religion that had a fascination for the African, but now the argument between the Africans and the Arab spoiling the performance they had, that almost 1,000 year performance that had been good not only for them but good for mankind. They had given North Africa some stability, and they had given the Western Sudan some stability. It came 1492, and the least significant event would be the so-called discovery of the New World. The greatest event in the history of that period would be really <coughs> the Africans and the Arabs, collectively called Moors, 
would lose their hold on Spain and be pushed out. Be pushed out of Spain and they would lose the Mediterranean. They had blocked Europe in the Mediterranean. They had forced Europe out of the Mediterranean and they had forced Europe into the Middle Ages. Now Europe had discovered longitude and latitude had come out of its box. They'd gone back to sea. They had learned maritime, some maritime techniques from school, from the school at Salamanca, that the Africans had translated the information from Spain. And they would turn on the very Africans who translated it for them in the very Arabs. The fight between the Africans and the Arabs would facilitate the rise of Europe. But except had the Africans and the Arabs got together at this point in history, fighting over various interpretations of Islam, they could have stopped Europe and stopped the slave trade, but instead of stopping the slave trade, the Arabs went into the slave trade, disgraced Islam, disgraced themselves, and left the African without protection, something which we should never forgive. Right. And after this, mixed Africans, Berbers, and Arabs in Morocco, sore heads, turn inward on Africa to rob the nations to the south. They recruited European mercenaries with modern weapons for that day and with some guns supplied by Queen Elizabeth I. They invaded the Western Sudan, destroyed the great state of Sangay in the long night that was to last 500 years had started. And the good that Islam had done was being spoiled. Now you had Muslim against Muslim facilitating the spread of the slave trade inland. I am saying that while this is one of the world's greatest religions, its redemption is going to come from Africans who will rescue it, give it a real meaning, <coughs> make it a world religion, <coughs> make it a world force for unity, and give it the sense of tolerance and respect for other cultures and religions that it once had, and integrate it into the concept of African culture and African liberation. Either do this or throw it into the ash can of history. Thank you. Yeah.